Well, I want to thank two wise and lovely ladies who exhorted me these past couple of weeks. First lady declared that we are living in eternity already. She speaks often about the spiritual realm. It's where we experience the mystery and the wonder of God. We are far too often stuck in the practical realm of doctor's appointments and shopping trips and daily chores. But every time we pray, we enter the spiritual realm. Every time the Holy Spirit works in us or gives us insight into the Word of God, we are in the spiritual realm. The second lady observed that our biggest hope is often overlooked on a week-by-week -week basis. She passionately demonstrated the need to remind ourselves regularly of the great anticipation, of the impact that it has on our worship and on our lives. She rightfully pointed out the lack of joyful discussion of the very thing that makes Advent Christian churches Advent Christian churches. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to remedy that today and going forward. And I want to thank Diane and Miss Lou for your faithfulness, love, and godliness. You have a direct impact on this church. The fact of the matter is we are living in eternity. This world is not our home. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 remind us that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. If you get nothing else from this, I want you to take away that. You know, all of us have different, different levels of physical needs. As we age, we have different struggles with health. But one day, it doesn't matter what our body is like here, Jesus will take our lowly bodies and give us that glorious body that is like his. Now, don't get me wrong. While we are alive on this earth, we are subject to the day-to-day -day practical world. But so are the billions of those who don't have Christ as their Lord and Savior. And while all humans have a spiritual component... Only those who have placed their faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ can enter into his spiritual realm. And only those who are his children have the hope that he promised us, that one day he is coming back. The second coming is an event that we often think about in these times, only when we're reminded of it. When a passage is read from the Bible. But let's face it, it isn't mentioned often, or at least not often enough. And you may be thinking it's because preachers don't teach on Revelation regularly. It's one book, and a complex one at that. But if you think that the book of Revelation is the only place where it is referenced, you'd be wrong. Listen to this from David Jeremiah's blog. He says, people are often surprised to learn that references to the second coming outnumber references to the first coming by a factor of eight to one. Scholars have identified 1,845 different biblical references to the second coming of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, no less than 17 books mention Christ's return. The New Testament authors speak of it in 23 of the 27 books. Seven out of ten chapters in the New Testament refer to his return. In other words, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament 
teaches us that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth. So we are going to be talking about it more, but we're going to be talking about it specifically today. So let's remind ourselves what this great hope is. First off, what is the second coming? Jesus describes it this way in Matthew 24, 30 and 31. He says, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says it this way. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. You know, we talk about the descriptions of it, but I think it's good to think about the two advents of, the major advents of Christ coming to this earth. The first coming, as well as the second coming. See what the differences are, because those differences are very important for us to understand. We already know it but it's good to detail it out. It's good to articulate it. So the first coming. First coming, Jesus said himself in a very concise way, in Luke 19.10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. Hebrews 9 says it this way, verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That right there shows the differences between the two. The entire passage of Hebrews is teaching about how the Old Testament priests would make sacrifices on an ongoing basis on behalf of the Israelites. But that Christ, being the final high priest, made the sacrifice once and for all. That is why he came the first time, to ransom himself for sinners. He came to save and provide new life for those the Father gave to him. He was the Lamb, sacrificed for many. But when he comes back, he's the Lion, bringing savage judgment to sin and sinners. Revelation 19, 11 to 16 describes it this way. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is an amazing image. It is a it's going to be an amazing time. We think of Jesus many times because of that first coming, and we should. We should be thinking of Jesus and the love he brought 
the love he gave to us in sacrificing himself for us. We think of the meekness that he had. We think of the model that he is. But we have to remember that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he will be coming back to judge. He will be coming back to wage war on the nations, on sin and sinners. We can't just think of the first coming without understanding the second coming. It is a fearsome, awesome, in the real way of that word, king who will be coming. He will, we will be full of awe. The world will be full of awe. The world will be frightened because of who is coming. We cannot remember, we cannot forget, I should say, to include the lion with the lamb. Now, the second coming we have talked about, um, I mentioned in the stats from David Jeremiah that it is done through the, uh, talked about through the Old Testament, talked about through the New Testament. Most of the time, I think, when we've heard about it, it has been through the New Testament. And what's interesting is that there's actually an Old Testament passage, I mean, there's a New Testament passage that talks about how old the prophecy is. And it's in Jude 1, 14. It says this. Jude writes, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. He says, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude references Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, who prophesied about the second coming. It was known by man even back then. Of course, it was known by God, planned by God from the beginning. This wasn't a new type of of Revelation in the New Testament. But again, if you read the scriptures, if you read the Bible as a whole, you understand that the Old Testament is constantly pointing, always pointing to Christ. It is always pointing to Christ. It's pointing to Christ for the first coming, and as we can see here, even though the the book uh, that Enoch is not recorded in the Old Testament, it was understood, even the great-grandfather of Noah understood this. But we can see it in other passages. You can see it in Daniel. You can see it in Ezekiel. You can see it in other passages where they point to this. The entire Bible is all about pointing to Christ. That's what's important that we understand this. The Lamb and the Lion. But when will it happen? You know, this is a kind of a funny thing that uh, there are people who love to make some weird game of this, of trying to figure out when this is going to happen. Throughout history, in fact, Jeannie and I were just talking about the other night, throughout history there have been plenty of people who have essentially scammed groups of people by saying that the Lord's coming back on a specific date. Well, I'll just go back to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36. He says this, But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So, you know, if you, if you want to play the lottery and try to guess it, you know, knock yourself out, but you're, you're, never going to, you're never going to know. There's no reason. Anytime you hear people who are trying to say, oh, it's going to be happening 
October 19th of this year. I, I say point and laugh at them. You know, just, just it, it is just a very, very, very silly thing. So we don't know when it's coming, but we know that it's coming. So what does it mean for us? How then shall we live? Well, I have a few things here that I want you to consider. We can live, number one, in a state of hope and peace. John 14, verses 1 to 3. This is Jesus talking. This is in the upper room. He says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. 1 Peter 1, 13 says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you where Jesus Christ is, is revealed at his coming. You know, we are supposed to not be letting our hearts be troubled. We live through dark times. We live through uncertain times. That no matter what happens to us, we are not to let our hearts be troubled. Through this life, no matter what happens to us, we look to that and say, we have our hope. We have our hope. And that gives us the ability to live in peace. We're not supposed to be worried. It's a very human thing to worry. But we're not supposed to be worried. We have our hope. So we should live and set our hope on the grace to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. At the same time, and this was, in this last verse, this was um, pointed to as well. But in, this, in the same time, we should be living in a state of readiness and preparation. Matthew 24, verses 42 and 44, says this. This is Jesus again. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. What is this readiness? What is this vigilance? You know, we're going to be brought up to be with him from this earth. We don't need time to pack. So what is the readiness that we have? What is the preparation that we should be focusing on? Well, part of it is following the Great Commission. Part of it is following what Jesus said in Matthew 28. And he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And he ends with this encouragement. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We should be preparing ourselves, but we should be preparing others to make them understand of the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ and that he's coming again. We have to follow Christ in being able to do good in our community. Doing good is part of the Great Commission, I believe. It's not just mission work to give tracts out or to tell somebody that, but to live like Christ, to be like Christ. 
That's part of our, our preparation and our readiness. And that leads to the number three, that we should live in a state of sanctification and holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, earlier in that passage that we read, 1 to 12, it says this. He says, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is what he tells them this is what he's encouraging and exhorting them before he even talks about the second coming. It is a, the second coming is a whole new thought, but this is what he was just telling them. So it places that second coming into context. This is how we should live until he comes. We have to live a holy life, but we should be sanctified. And I think we need to be like the Thessalonians in our love for one another. I love how he says this. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. So he's validating that they indeed love what he had. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. We can't stop loving. We can't keep, we can't love to some small degree or some large degree. Whatever setting we think, whatever line we draw and say that's our love, we have to keep exceeding it. We have to go beyond that. We have to do so more and more. That's what we need to be doing until Jesus comes. Titus 2, 11. Through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. While we are waiting, we have to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives. That's direct instruction. You know, the first coming brought salvation a grace to this evil world. Second coming will bring judgment to this evil world. These two pillars of history are the very substance of hope. Without the first, the second would be nothing but a fearsome and hopeless future for us. Without the second, our hope would only be limited to this life. 
Our responsibility in light of these two wonderful and mind-blowing events is to live in peace and hope, to be ready, and to live a holy life every day for our Lord. We live in dark de days indeed, and there is every reason and indication that they will get darker. But we have an assurance that no matter how evil the world is or becomes, there is one thing that we know for sure, and we should remind ourselves and each other every day, that one day every knee will bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, the King is coming.